Okay, so we're on the fun part of our module. We're gonna we're gonna go over this case brief by ourselves, and and again, this will be your participation assignment for this week. And I know there's a lot this week, but it's all important stuff. Okay, so before we start looking at the case, um, want to just give you a little information on what it's about. So the Peterson case. This was Drew Peterson. Uh, part of his, the rigmarole on his murder trial. But what this appeal was about was about the admission or non-admission of what's called hearsay statements. So hearsay is a legal term, which is an out of court statement offered in evidence to support the truth of the matter asserted. So if I tell my husband, I'm going to kill you. And then at the trial, my husband said, she said, I'm going to kill you. That's hearsay. So hearsay, as a rule, is not admissible. Um, there's, because, yeah, basic rule that testimony or documents which quote, quote, persons not in court are not admissible because the trier of fact cannot judge the demeanor and credibility of me, right? So if I'm, I could have said, I'm going to kill you, tickle, 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 right? Like that. It, um, so they can't, you know, it, it's it's generally inadmissible, but there's like a gazillion reasons, exceptions to this rule against hearsay. I had like a month of it or whatever, two weeks of it in the bar review class. And um, there's a whole course on evidence and probably, you know, a month on the rule against hearsay. So things like an admission against interest, business records in the regular course of interest, government records, um, items used to refresh rec recollections. There's a bunch of exceptions to the rule. Learn treatise, look at all this stuff. Contemporary dying declaration um, are all exceptions to the rule against hearsay. So we're going to be talking about the rule against hearsay in a Peterson decision and um, one exception to this rule against hearsay called forfeiture uh, by wrongdoing. So that is um, our background. And then let me get to, where's my, oh, here it is. Here's my case. Okay, so when I'm doing a, a brief, first thing that I want to do is have either a document open or uh, pa paper and a pad. And I'm going to, um, some headings here. So I have case and citation, acts, procedure, rules, analysis, conclusion. Maybe I can put disposition too for fun. And then as I'm reading through my case, maybe I make this um, over here and I make this small over here, I can add stuff to my, to my case brief. Okay. So for my case and citation, I have my case. It's people, the Peterson. If you look it up, there's a bunch of different decisions in this Peter people versus Peterson litigation on different parts of the litigation. So we're just going to look at this one isolated case. Okay, and my site, this is my official reporter site. Pretty easy. So it's 2012 IL A B. Oh, I don't even need the period. 3D. And then my virtual page, which is 1005 14-B. Okay. Um, and that's it for my case and citation. Done. I don't even need to write that out now because that's just the top of my case. Okay. So this is, again, these are editorial enhancements, my overview, my case summary, and then we get down to my opinion here. But I can look 
All right, so I'm just going to go to my opinion. Okay, so facts, these are the underlying facts. Um, so defendant. I don't know why I'm in all caps. Charged with what? Two counts of murder. Um, uh, ex-wife, we'll say ex-wife, Kathleen, I don't know if she, Savio. Um, okay, procedure at pretrial court issued rulings on admissibility of evidence okay um Okay, so one of these appeals, the state argued that the circuit court erred. So here's my, oh, there we go. Graph right in my issue. Did the circuit court err when it denied the state's motion in limine. A motion in limine means like, you know, out before court, but outside of the, um, before the trial actually started. Uh, to admit certain here, oh, I always spell heresy. <laughs> heresy statements. under the common common law doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing i'm gonna abbreviate that later on as f but you know just save myself typing FXB, forfeiture by wrongdoing. Oh, XFW. All right, it can be FBW. Let's do that. Um, okay, so let's say back to procedure, appellate court held. No jurisdiction because appeal was untimely. Illinois Supreme Court. Oops, I want to be over here. Um, vacated a court judgment and, you know, remanded it to the appellate court for a decision. Okay, all right, so here we go. Okay, this is again what we call an interlocutory appeal. We talked about this in the um, second part of the lecture. So um, that's why this one's a little different. Okay, so back up to facts. See how this little format is an easy way to do it? Um, 
Okay, Kathleen Savio. So we have March 1. This one's kind of good to do it by date, 2004. Savio was found dead in the bathtub. Police did autopsy and found accidental drowning. Oh, found it, not accidental. We'll call it drowning. And then, all right. All right, we'll just send, we'll call it accidental because it's like the coroner, not the, whatever. Um, okay. Several months before Kathleen's death, the judge presiding over the divorce proceedings was, okay, so at this time, time her death, um, she was undergoing divorce proceedings with defendant. Um, property distribution hearing was set for April of 2004. Um, see that? March, April. Okay, now we, I don't know why this is. Fast forward to October 27th, 2007, the defendant's fourth wife, let's call her Stacy, um, disappeared. The couple had been discussing divorce. Um, Savio's body was then exhumed and pathologists concluded her death was a homicide. Um, okay, so now we're in May 2009, defendant charged with murder of Savio. Okay. Back to procedure here. Okay. So back to our motion. So the motion argued that 11 statements made by Savio and three statements made by Stacy were admissible under, what is it? Let's just call it 115-2.6 of Code of 
criminal okay so now we're going to go we know that this is a rule i'm going to copy that put that under my rules which is here we call that the this is the hearsay exception for the intentional murder of a witness. And also, and under the common law doctrine of FBW, forfeiture by wrongdoing, common law doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing. Okay, so that's the second rule. Common law rules um okay so this first part here i'm just gonna cut and paste because it's oh i can i oh. what do i do let me get out of here okay so i'll just i guess i'll write it out because it's not letting me copy and paste it so there's three requirements on this A. Okay. Party has killed the. Oh my gosh. The declarant. Intent to procure with the, I will say with the intent to procure the unavailability of the declarant as a witness. in a cr criminal or civil proceeding. Um, and then these statements over here provide sufficient safeguards of reliability and interests of justice would be served by their admission. Okay, so for this, under this code, there, there has to be four things ha that have to be satisfied. Party killed the declarant, intent that they were unavailable as a witness, um, safeguards of re reliability, and I don't know why I can't, uh, um, and justice is served. Okay, so that's, that's the requirements of that rule. Now, under the common law doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing, the elements for this to apply are uh, where is it? I'm on this page here. Oh, 
Okay, so it's statements. Okay, so it's just that the witness is unavailable. Okay, defendant intentionally made the witness unavailable. And then the part B is to prevent her from testifying. Okay, and this, you know, so let's, if we want a source of this, people v. Hansen what they're citing for it. Oh, come on. Okay, People versus Hansen. All right, so those are my rules. Um, more back to our procedure. Uh <sighs> Under this code of cr criminal procedure, there needs to be a hearing held, held in 2010, and the court found Where's my hearing? There are oh, 72 witnesses testified at the hearing, three pathologists, a lot of the big hearing. Um, and they took it under advisement and they found that they had proved by preponderance of the evidence. So it wasn't a beyond the reasonable doubt. Um, the court found defendant murdered Kathleen. with the intent to make, oh, Kathleen and Stacy, oh boy, with the intent to make them unavailable as witnesses. And six of the 14 statements had sufficient safeguards of reliability. How many? Eight, six. Um, and so, so we're eight were excluded. And we'll say and interests of justice. I'm taping a lecture. She's sleeping. She's okay. Oh, I guess not. Okay. Um, so, not in this hearing, the court didn't address. All right, hearing did not address whether statements were admissible under forfeiture by wrongdoing. Um, okay. So then they appeal. So then we say plaintiff appeals. Okay, and then I can just, you know, this stuff goes down here. Because that's chronological there. And now we're back in the appellate court. All right. All right. Buh, 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 buh. Okay, so this is, we're all back. Now Now we're on our 
So we have our issues and where's my issue? Yeah. And this should be a question. I have my issue and I have my rules written out. See, now we just need my analysis, my conclusion. Okay. Under my analysis here, um, the state. So, and then the reason why this has to be an interlocutory appeal. So we're in a criminal case here. And if the state loses because all of this evidence hasn't been introduced, they lose forever because of double jeopardy. They cannot go back, appeal this legal error and retry a defendant who's been acquitted because our constitution pro prohibits that under the doctrine of double jeopardy. So that's why it's important that this is an interlocutory appeal. The state gets the right, the ruling that they want now so that they can introduce all of this and hopefully on their end, convict the defendant for murder. Okay. So that's the, the claim of error, which is our issue. Um, it's an abuse of discretion standard. Um, it's a de novo review. So they're reviewing it l like it's the beginning. Um, so they say the answer is they, they made a mistake. Okay. So here's our common law doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing. So they're saying forfeiture by wrongdoing is 130 years old. There's, um, it was 1997. It's uh, adopted by the federal rules of evidence as an exception to the rule against hearsay, um, which, did, and then in 2007, I don't really, 2007, Illinois Supreme Court adopts um, forfeiture by wrongdoing as Illinois law, this common law doctrine. Um, which allows for admission of hearsay, qualifying, we'll call it qualifying hearsay statements, even without liability assurances. You don't need any additional indica of reliability. Okay. Um, in contrast to this, statutory exception requires safeguards. Um, okay. So this was in 2010, Illinois Supreme court adopts what they call the Illinois rules of evidence. effective in 2011, which codified existing evidence rules in the state. Including our, for, our doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing.
doesn't let me cut and paste from a PDF, which is annoying. Okay. Um, which so which is becomes Illinois Rule of Evidence 804 B5. Um, now they say um, Supreme Court, Illinois Supreme Court. Because of separation of powers, excellent, has ultimate authority to determine evidentiary rules. So it says where a statute conflicts with the, the rule of evidence, where a statute conflicts with a rule of evidence, rule of evidence prevails. Um, accordingly, therefore, conflict between um, what do we call this again? One fifteen point six N forfeiture by wrongdoing doctrine. is resolved by applying the forfeiture by wrongdoing. Okay, so here if we apply this applying forfeiture by wrongdoing does not require safeguards so all statements are admissible Um, this is just fun stuff. This is what we call like dicta, dicta, not dicta, dicta, um, where it's not law, but um, it's just kind of funny stuff. So the legislate this this um, rule one fifteen ten point six was was adopted specifically uh, to convict to get a Drew Drew Peterson um, and allow these statements to be admissible. So they pass this um, where is it and um, they're basically saying that the guy the guy who drafted it made made a big mistake say so the common law doctrine was broader um, And it was like, was it needed? Passing a more narrow, restrictive statute, they must have had the intent to afford greater protections to criminal def defendants. Um, so, the, you know, they're like, you can't have it both ways. This challenge to the state's position is published, puzzling, um, whatever they reverse it. There's something in here about now the Will County state's attorney said he wrote the statute 
um, basically saying that the guy kind of screwed up. So um, therefore they reverse. So where's my conclusion? Where's my issue? Um, copy and paste that. Yes. We'll call it, we'll say the trial court, um, trial court. Aired when it denied. All statements should have been admitted because there is no requirement required safeguards of reliability under the common law doctrine of forfeiture by wrongdoing um, and that law applies in this case over the criminal the code of criminal procedure okay so that's our conclusion our disposition is reversed and remanded so the decision of the trial court was reversed and now it's remanded back to the trial court to proceed to trial Okay, so that's it. Do this, uh, you know, hopefully you've been kind of typing as I've been spouting my nonsense and um, you can submit this for participation. Have a great day.